Namaskar and a very good afternoon to one and all. On behalf of PRL, I, D. Pallam Raju, welcome all of you who are joining us live in today's event via WebEx platform and PRL's YouTube channel to this, the 71st PRL Ka Amrit Vyakhyam. PRL came into existence in the year 1947. And so along with the nation's 75th year celebrations of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, PRL is celebrating its Platinum Jubilee year. As part of the Platinum Jubilee celebrations, PRL has initiated several exciting programs and events. And one among them is this lecture series, which is uh, called the PRL Ka Amrit Vyakhyan, wherein we invite people of eminence in the fields of sciences, engineering, technology, arts, literature, business, and law to share with us their excitements in their respective domains so that we can enhance our knowledge. Uh, there will be 75 of such uh, Vyakhyans of this series, which started on the 4th of August last year and will be going on until uh, early next uh, year. All the lectures delivered so far are available in PRL's YouTube channel, and I encourage all of you to view these excellent lectures. I take this opportunity uh, yeah. First, all of you to please stay tuned on all the weeks of uh, generally Wednesdays for the forthcoming lectures as well. Today, the 71st uh, PRL Kamrud Vyakhyan will be delivered by yet another eminent person, Professor K.S. Vishwanathan, who is uh, currently a visiting professor at Kriya University at Sri City. He is going to deliver his Vyakhyan on an interesting topic, hydrogen bonded interactions, pawns in the game of molecular chess. On behalf of PRL, I thank Professor Vishwanathan for kindly accepting our invitation and agreeing to deliver this Vyakhyan. To formally introduce the speaker to the audience, I will invite my colleague, Professor Balamurugan Sivaraman. Bala, over to you. Thank you, Professor Pallam Raju. It is an honor and it's a pleasure to introduce the speaker in today's Vyakhyan. Professor K. S. Vishwanathan, I know him as a matrix isolation infra infrared spectroscopist, but more than that, there's a lot of things. And he's a very good speaker, so I'm going to keep the introduction very short and give most of the time to Professor Vishwanathan. Professor K. S. Vishwanathan is currently a visiting professor at the Department of Sciences, Kriya University, Sri City. He's completed BSc and MSc from Vivekananda College, Madras, and obtained his PhD degree in physical chemistry from the Vanderbilt University in USA. He was the head of the Department of Chemical Sciences and Dean at ISER Mohali. Professor Vishwanathan's research interest includes, as I said before, matrix isolation and infrared spectroscopy. He's an expert in that for the study of conformations and non-covalent interactions and reactions of high temperature species. <laughs> yes, he has several awards to his name and he's actively engaged engaging himself, of course, in the science education in schools and universities, he, even now. He has obtained the first rank in the college in MSc, and he's the medal awarded by the Madras University for securing the first rank. And then he has got the Kalpakam Science and Technology Award for the best basic research work in 1999 and 2001. Indian Spectroscopic Association awarded him the 2010 uh, award for the contributions in matrix isolation spectro and fluorescent spectroscopy. With this short introduction, I would like to invite uh, Professor Vishnathan on behalf of the uh, our PRL uh, director and dean and the committee. We look forward to hearing about the hydrogen bond, how it is the bond in the molecular chess. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Bala. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Professor Raju. It's, it's a pleasure for me to be here and talking to you all. So let me share this uh, my screen, which uh, can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Ah, okay, good. I got the hang of it now. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank, thank you very much again. And uh, what I will now do is uh, talk to you about some of our work that we did years ago, 
few years ago at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research at Mohali and mainly concentrating on the topic of uh, hydrogen bonds. I have titled my talk as hydrogen bonds, which are pawns in the game of molecular chess. But as we go along, you will see why my title has been so framed. As I said, the work was done at Aisar Mohali, and this is the campus at Aisar Mohali where I worked for about eight years. And of course, when we speak about Mohali, you can't miss the Punjab Cricket Association Cricket Stadium. I'm a very serious cricket uh, enthusiast. Therefore, I cannot help but show you the cricket ground at, uh, at Mohali, which is a very famous cricket ground in India. And the, the question, therefore, is why do we call uh, hydrogen bonds as the pawns in the game of uh, molecular chess? And, and then I will go ahead and explain to you the, the, the very important role that hydrogen bonds make in the whole of uh, chemistry and physics. Now, we know of chemistry that uh, most of chemistry chemistry basically involves discussing bonds and molecular structures and properties and so on and when we start talking about uh, chemical bonds you know there are good number of uh, types of bonds that you come across for example you can take two hydrogens and put them together uh, hydrogen atoms and put them together and you get a hydrogen hydrogen molecule which should be bound together by a covalent bond which is a pretty strong bond and which would uh, have rare energies in the length of a few hundred kilocalories per mole. Or I could take sodium ion and a chloride ion, put them together and form a sodium chloride molecule, which would be the ionic bond, uh, different from the covalent bond in the way it is structured and the way it is, this architecture goes. But again, the point is both are extremely strong bonds and are uh, important in the formation of molecules. When you talk about hydrogen bonds, they are very different in the sense that if I take a water molecule, for example, and I show the covalent bond over here, which is between the oxygen and hydrogen, the dotted line is the one that refers to the hydrogen bond, which is actually a very weak interaction that exists between two water molecules. You have one water molecule on the top, you have another water molecule on the, at the bottom, and the two are linked together by a very weak interaction, which I can call as the OHO interaction. So interaction being essentially between the hydrogen of one molecule and the oxygen of the other water molecule. Now the interaction between hydrogen attached to an electronegative atom, so this is hydrogen attached to an electronegative atom, and it is interacting with another electronegative atom, has been classically called as the hydrogen bond. So if you pick up the textbooks, the older ones, they will always talk about a hydrogen bond as a bond that exists between a hydrogen attached to an electronegative atom and attached to another electronegative atom as is shown over here. But you will see very, very quickly that this definition is no longer going to be adequate. So here's the structure for it. The oxygen over here has a small negative charge. The hydrogen over here has a small positive charge. The oxygen here has a small negative charge. And there is this very weak interaction between this weak positive hydrogen and the weak negative oxygen that gives rise to this hydrogen bond. These are very weak intermolecular interactions. And we will see what the nature of the hydrogen bond is. For one thing, hydrogen bond doesn't occur just as just between two molecules, but it will actually be a large array structure. So you can have one water molecule attached to another, then this water molecule gets attached to another one, and then so on and so forth until you have a big array of molecules <laughs> <coughs> that are attached, like the way the picture shows. Now, the length of a hydrogen bond over here, it could be quite large. I think uh, this could be, for example, uh, 0.99 and this is, I think it's most long is a typographical error longer than the normal covalent bond and also quite stronger than a covalent bond. The covalent bond might be typically about 118 kilocalories per mole whereas the hydrogen bond typically would be about 5 kilocalories per mole. So you can al already see that we are talking of uh, energies that are about you know, orders of magnitude smaller than the covalent bonds or the ionic bonds which are the ones that really make up the molecular architecture. How would you define or describe it? We can define the hydrogen bond as the bond existing between two molecules, such as what is shown over here. Or as I will show you later, it can also be a bond between two fragments of the same molecule. So one end of the molecule might be latching on to the other end of the molecule through a hydrogen bonded interaction. So it's a weak bond between two molecules or between two fragments of the same molecule. And this interaction between a hydrogen attached to an electronegative atom 
and bonding to another electronegative atom is as i said is the classical picture or the classical definition but very soon by the end of the talk you will see that this definition is woefully inadequate and we will have to expand our definition to include newer types of hydrogen bonded interactions now these hydrogen bonding interactions are extremely weak interactions as you have as i've already shown you Covalent bonds could be like 100, 150 kilocalories per mole, whereas the hydrogen bonding interactions are typically about 5 kilocalories per mole. So they're extremely weak, and therefore the question arises, if they are that weak, why are we even worried about them? The stronger bond that should be defining the whole of chemistry, so why are we even studying the very weak interactions that make up the hydrogen bonds? The point is that the hydrogen bonds are extremely prevalent in many chemical, biochemical, and physical systems. Oceans of water, there are hydrogen bonds in there. Clouds have hydrogen bonds. Many of these trees, you know, the, the, the structure in the wood, they have hydrogen bonds. Ice has hydrogen bonds and so on. DNA is structured with hydrogen bonds. There are supramolecular architecture which have hydrogen bonds. So the question, therefore, is it is not the point that it is just weak. It is so very prevalent and therefore it must be studied to understand its role in the makeup of all these little things that I showed you. So why are hydrogen bonds so important? The very first introduction that we get to hydrogen bonds is when we in school ask this question, why is the boiling point of, let us say, the uh, group 6A elements so structured? For example, if you take the H2TE, its a boiling point is about minus 2 degrees. If you go to the next element, H2SE, it's about minus 41. The boiling point little bit, is a little bit lower. You go to hydrogen sulfide, the boiling point is about minus 60. So if you look at this trend, you should expect the boiling point of water should be around minus 75. But we know the boiling point of water is not minus 75. It's about 100, it's 100 degrees centigrade under one atmosphere for pure water and so on. So the question therefore is why is there a sharp jump from the trend that you saw up till hydrogen sulfide, but then when you come to water, the, the pattern is just broken and you have a high, the boiling point of water 100 degrees centigrade which is very different from the expected value of minus 75 degrees centigrade and the reason of course we know the reason is the hydrogen bonding interactions in water are quite strong and which is responsible for this very huge change in the property and therefore there lies the the importance as to why one must study hydrogen bonding interactions so this interaction between the hydrogen of one water molecule and the oxygen of the other water molecule, which is what is keeping the hydrogen, the water molecule structure together, and which is what you must break to have the water boil, is the one causing this higher boiling point of water to be so very different from the expected trend that you saw based on H2TE, H2SE, and, base, and H2S. All these elements belong to a group, and we learn in chemistry is that elements in a group give you similar properties and so on, but you can see here that there's an exception. Oxygen belongs to the same group, but shows a boiling point, water shows a boiling point that is extremely different simply because the hydrogen bonding in water is that much stronger. The hydrogen bond also forces water molecules to hold on to each other very strongly. This leads to a water surface to behave as a sheet, which is basically a manifestation of the high surface tension of water. And it is this property that helps some insects to actually walk on water. So you can see the importance and the role that hydrogen bonding plays in many other applications. Hydrogen bond and specific heat is another issue that one would like to talk about. Because the moment you have a hydrogen bond, then that bond actually serves as a storage sink of energy. Every bond is basically a storage sink for energy. Now this sink therefore makes it harder for the rays to raise the temperature of water. Because the moment you put energy into the water molecule to raise this temperature, the energy gets stored into these sinks, into these bonds. And since there are a large number of hydrogen bonds, these hydrogen bonds soak up the energy and therefore delay the raise of temperature in water. And this is what we call as water having a high specific heat. Now, this is the equivalent of what we learn in geography, that the land heats up faster and also cools down faster than water because of the high specific heat. Hence, cities near the large bodies of water, like the beaches, have a temperature climate, have a temperate climate relative to cities that are far inland. The high specific heat also leads to the oceans storing a good part of the energy because the hydrogen bonds serve as storage sinks and therefore they store a large part of the energy that results from the greenhouse effects which in, learn, which in turn leads to climate change. So we can therefore see that the hydrogen bond also influences in a big way the many concepts in geosciences. 
they determine the very important det determine molecular structures. For example, if you have the double helix of the DNA, these DNA strands are basically held together by the hydrogen bonding interactions between these strands. Beta sheets of proteins, for example, they are held together by hydrogen bonding interactions. And therefore, you can see that hydrogen bonds play a huge role in physics, chemistry, biosciences, geosciences, and so on and so forth. As also, as I gave you an earlier example, that they also play a very important role in crystal architecture by holding together fragments of the crystal and giving you the appropriate crystal structure. Well, I can go on and on. You could say that hydrogen bonds are supremely important in determining many chemical and biochemical properties. They are important in reactivity, determining reactivities. They determine solvation phenomena and so on and so forth. And as I said, etc., etc., etc. But I'm very sure by now you are convinced that hydrogen bonding interactions are weak interactions, but then they influence a lot of biology, chemistry, physics, and other sciences. The question is, if they are so weak, how is it they are able to influence so many of these subjects like chemistry, biology, geosciences, and so on. How do you relate the two? They are so weak and yet so important. And I've often made the point that hydrogen bonding interactions are weak interactions, but they are very telling interactions. They are very weak interactions, but they are telling because of the fact that hydrogen bonds actually, as I showed you earlier, work in groups. They don't work alone. You know, They don't work in isolation. They basically work in a way that they are all so much intertwined and therefore, even though they are weak, they work in a very cooperative effect. They have a very so, sort of a cooperative effect. And this has also been referred to as the Gulliver effect. When Gulliver was tied down by the Lilliputians with very weak, with very small strings, each string was small, but there were so many of them that Gulliver found it hard to break out of the captivity that they, that they held him in. And this is basically what we call as the Gulliver effect. Each bond is weak but they work in cooperation. There are a large number of them working together. And it is this cooperativity phenomena that makes the hydrogen bonds so very telling, so very important. And I like to relate it to chess because in chess, if you look at it, the one of the weakest pieces on the chess board is essentially the pawn. All other pieces are much more powerful, much more effective in the way they play the game. But the number of pawns in a chess board is much larger than all the other pieces. You have eight pawns. And if these eight pawns can work in coordination, then you actually have a very strong attacking or a very strong defensive maneuver that you can play in chess. And good chess players uh, worry a lot about the chess formation that they can have with the pawns. And therefore, while these pawns are very weak, if they work in cooperation, if they work in tandem, you can actually see that they can provide a very strong game that you can play in chess. And that is the reason why I relate or I can I compare the hydrogen bonding interactions to the chess pawns on the board. Weak pieces, but they work in coordination, eight, eight of them, and therefore they become extremely important in the way the game unfolds. And that is why my title, Hydrogen Bonds, we, they are pawns, hydrogen bonds, which are pawns in the game of molecular chess. <clears throat> Hence, the study of hydrogen bonds is very interesting. It is very, very important. And I'm sure by now, I would have convinced you that this study is therefore extremely important. A little bit of history. The concept of hydrogen bonds has been attributed to Huggins in 1919. So you can see this is a concept that is more than 100 years old. Latimer and Rothbusch spoke about it in 1920. And however, from early, even as early as 1902, Werner, Hansch, and Pfeiffer were murmuring about the existence of these weak bonds, but it was only the, the after the work of Huggins and Latimer and Rothbusch that this concept of hydrogen bonds became something that people could talk about uh, more, more firmly. What are hydrogen bonds characterized by? They are characterized by the following. They are very small interaction energies, 5 kilocals per mole, as I told you earlier. Electron transfer between two moieties, but that is not surprising because all of chemistry involves electron transfer between two, two moieties. But then, likewise, hydrogen bonds also involve transfer of electron between two moieties. And the hydrogen bonds sometimes are preferred geometries. Namely, the OHO direction is you know, tries to be linear. because so that's the best way that they can maximize this interaction. But this is not always true. And we have seen that in many cases, there is a deviation from this linearity. But in general, the hydrogen bonds would like to form linear architectures. <clears throat> what are the challenges in the study of hydrogen bonds? The challenges in the study of hydrogen bonds are the following. For one, the hydrogen bonds are too weak, as we already have seen. They're too weak. And any interaction that is too weak 
actually becomes very difficult to study because they are only whispers in the whole uh, chemistry that goes on. The weak, the strong bonds are literally making a lot of noise, but the hydrogen bonds are basically whispers in all of this. And therefore, it is extremely difficult to study weak interactions because of the fact that you have to study them in the midst of other strong interactions. So challenges are first, it's too weak. And therefore, how do we observe hydrogen bonding form formation experimentally if it is so weak? But here's a little cartoon I show you. I have two hydrogen water molecules. And let us say they get together and form a hydrogen bond. And once they form a hydrogen bond, which is the one shown by the arrow, and which we said is extremely weak. And now I have to figure out experimentally that this bond actually has been formed. But as I said, the experimental challenge is a very weak bond. And therefore, what experimental method am I going to follow to be able to decipher this weak bond? What we essentially do is we take a recourse to something very different. We look at these very strong bonds that are always there, the covalent bonds. And as a result of the formation of this weak bond, these covalent bonds actually get perturbed, meaning that the vibration frequency of these OH bonds get a little bit uh, uh, put up as a result of the formation of this OH bond. So I'm not looking at the OH bond per se, but I'm looking at the telltale signals of the bonds around to let me know that an OH bond has actually formed. So this is one way to do it. Not look at the bond per se, but look at the perturbations in the adjoining effect on the adjoining bonds. What is the effect that I'm talking about? So if I have this water molecule and let us say the vibration frequency of these OH bonds are roughly, let us say, around 3,700 wave numbers. The moment the hydrogen bond is formed, the 3,700 gets shifted just a little bit. Now, it could get shifted by five wave numbers. It could get shifted by 200 wave numbers or so. And all that would depend on how strong this hydrogen bond is. If it's a strong hydrogen bond, the shift can be quite large. It could be a few hundred wave numbers. In fact, we have seen in some of our experiments, hydrogen bond shifting by a few hundred wave numbers. But if the hydrogen bond is weak, then the covalent bonds, the, the vibration frequency of the OH bonds get shifted by just about five or 10 wave numbers, which is very small, but which is still observable. So if you see shifts in these bonds, then you know that you have formed a hydrogen bond. And this is the strategy that many of us adopt in studying the hydrogen bond. As I said, by not looking at the hydrogen bond per se, but by looking at the effect of the hydrogen bond on the adjacent vibrations. And you therefore measure spectral shifts of the OH vibrations that result as a, due to the formation of the hydrogen bond. What is the second challenge? The second challenge is, as we said earlier, hydrogen bonds don't occur in isolation. They occur, you know, as large arrays. So you're having a lot of hydrogen bonds and therefore, what are you really studying? So it would be nice if I could just have one water molecule interacting with another molecule with just one hydrogen bond. And then I could study that and try to understand the nature of the hydrogen bond. But in a picture like this, where I have so many hydrogen bonds formed, it is very hard to delineate what is really going on. So the experimental technique must involve doing something like this. I take this complex, complex picture, I remove all the other water molecules, leave behind just two, and see if I can study this. So the experimental challenge is to take this very complex picture and simplify it somehow. Is there an experimental technique by which I can completely mute all but one of the hydrogen bonds so that I can study them? If I can do that, then yes, I have a method by which I can study a one-on-one -on -one interaction, therefore getting a very clear picture as to what the hydrogen bonding interaction really is. And of course, I know how to study it because I'm going to study it by its perturbation on the adjacent bonds. And what is the third co complication? The third complication is hydrogen bonds can show you isomeric structures. And what do I mean by isomeric structures? Let's take the example of water and ammonia. Now, water can latch on to ammonia through a hydrogen bonding interaction like this. Earlier, I showed you one water molecule interacting with another water molecule. But here I'm showing you one water molecule that interacts with another ammonia molecule. And again, through this OHN type interaction. So you have the water molecule, the hydrogen of the water molecule latches onto the nitrogen, and therefore I have an OHN interaction. Now, this is the hydrogen bonding structure of water and ammonia, in which water is the proton donor because it donates the proton for the formation of the hydrogen bonding complex. And the nitrogen is a proton acceptor in the formation of the hydrogen bonding complex. 
Now you can have an alternate structure in which ammonia donates the proton and water accepts the proton. So this is what I mean by an isomeric structure. So for the same two partners of water and ammonia, I can have one structure in which water donates the proton to ammonia and forms the hydrogen bonding complex, or I can have ammonia donating a proton to water and having a hydrogen bonding complex. Now you have to have an experimental technique to decide which is which that you're really seeing. And that is another complication. Now, of course, the energies of these two complexes may not be the same and they most likely will not be the same. Water being the proton donor is a much stronger complex, so it will be the global minimum, meaning it will be the strongly bound complex. And water and ammonia donating a proton to water, which is relatively weaker, would be the local minimum, which would essentially mean that it's the complex that is relatively weaker than the one in which water is the proton donor. But the point is, in an experiment, it is quite possible that you could form both. And your experimental technique must be a, capable enough to tell what is it that you're really seeing. And about this is the third complication that you have in the study of hydrogen bonds. Just to recap, what are the difficulties? Extremely weak, too many interactions. So you'll have to mute many of them and keep just one of them. And third is the possibility of an isomerism. And therefore, you should be able to figure out what structure is it am I really looking at. As I go on in the talk, I will start talking to you about these different structures that you can possibly see, and we will see how delineate them. So the bottom line, therefore, is how, how what's the experimental technique? I need an experimental technique that can address all the three issues that I mentioned earlier. Now, one such technique is matrix isolation spectroscopy, which is what I was doing for a very long time. And uh, there are other techniques. There's a supersonic jet expansion uh, experiment, which I won't talk to you about today, but I will show some results from those studies. And it's a good complementary work. You know, whatever you do with matrix isolation and you compare them the, with the work that is done with the supersonic jet expansion, the two works put together can all very, uh, very often can give you extremely good uh, data or extremely good information about the hydrogen bonding interactions. So I will talk to you about the matrix isolation spectroscopy work that we have been doing for a long time. And I will show you how this technique actually addresses all the three problems. What are the three problems? Extremely weak interactions, too many of them, and the possibility of isomerism. Now, what is this iso matrix isolation spectroscopy? What we do in matrix isolation spectroscopy is the following. I mix the sample that I want to study. Let us say I want to study the hydrogen bonding interaction of water with another water molecule. Okay. So the, now, therefore, water becomes my sample. So I mix the sample of water with a large excess of an inert gas. What do I mean by large excess? By large excess, I mean that for every one water molecule that I have, I have about 1,000 atoms of argon. So I prepare a gas mixture, a vapor mixture, in which I have plenty of argon, very little water, and the ratio is one molecule of water roughly to about 1,000 atoms of argon that I have in this gas mixture. Once I have this gas mixture, I let the gas mixture fuse into a vacuum system where the vacuum could be typically of the order of 10 power minus 6 to 10 power minus 7 door. And right there inside the vacuum system, I will have a small KBR potassium bromide window, which serves as the window to record infrared spectra. But in this case, this is also my substrate in which I will do the deposition. Now, this potassium bromide window, mind you, is kept at extremely low temperatures. It's kept at a temperature of around 10 Kelvin. So when I send this gas mixture of water and argon, where water is one part and argon is 1,000 parts, this gas mixture just flows towards this KBR window, potassium bromide window, at cryo kept at cryogenic temperatures, and will actually deposit onto it to form a solid film. Now, this is a solid film of water and argon, and that is basically what I'm trying to prepare. Now, what will that solid film look like? Well, it will look like this. Assume that here is the penguin, which is the matrix gas, and this angry bird is your water molecule. So since I have argon in large excess, what would I see? I will see argon almost everywhere. And here, there, and somewhere, water would be deposited. So the whole uh, reason as to why I chose 1 is to 1,000 was to have argon in excess and water so dilute that when this film was formed, it is basically I'm going to have argon everywhere and water is just doped in... <coughs> <laughs> in the solid, in you know, at some locations. It is highly unlikely that two water molecules would be close to each other. 
In other words, what I have really done is I prepared a sample of monomeric water molecules. So if I record a spectrum of this sample, what I will get is the spectrum of water, which is not interacting with anything else, no hydrogen bonding interactions or anything whatsoever. We will see later how I can bring the hydrogen bonding interaction. But as of now, what I have is a sample of water that is completely non-interacting. And when I say non-interacting, I'm making this assertion because the only partners for water are argon. The neighbors for water is argon over here. Argon is inert, it is not going to interact. And therefore the water molecule inside here, surrounded by argon, is basically sitting in an inert environment. It does, it does not have any partner, partner to interact with. So therefore I will get the spectrum of monomeric water molecules, no interaction with anything else. And when you do that, what happens is the infrared spectrum actually gets to be extremely sharp. It gets sharp because there are no interactions. The molecules are all nailed down in the matrix at cryogenic temperature. They are not moving. So you don't have any Doppler broadening and so on. And then what you have now is an extremely sharp infrared spectra. The bottom one is the gas phase spectra of a certain molecule. Don't worry about what the molecule is. It's a gas phase spectrum. Of the same molecule, I have the liquid spectrum as the second one. And you can see the peaks are reasonably broad. But if I take the same one, which is dimethyl carbonate, and then if I record the spectrum in this argon matrix, you can see that the peaks become extremely sharp. And they become extremely sharp because I have basically removed most of the line broadening mechanisms. And I'm also recording the spectrum of the molecule as a monomeric substance, no interaction with anything else. And this is the experimental facility that we built and we were using. The A over here is the cryostat which gets me down to 10 Kelvin at the, at the tip of which I have mounted the potassium bromide window. I need vacuum, therefore your B would be the diffusion pump would provides for me the vacuum of about 10 power minus six to low, low 10 power minus, uh, high 10 power minus seven. And here an Fourier transform infrared spectrometer, which is the one that records the infrared spectrum. And you have a mixing chamber over here, D, where I mix the argon and the water and produce this gas mixture and then lead the gas mixture into my cryostat chamber where the deposition occurs. And of course, F is the argon cylinder. And this is of course a nitrogen cylinder. You can do experiments either with argon or with nitrogen because nitrogen also is inert as far as this experiment is concerned. Okay. So this is basically what the experiment looks like. And what you essentially are trying to do is to prepare isolated molecules of water, isolated in argon or nitrogen, deposited at 10 Kelvin, and then you record the infrared spectrum. Advantages, it's extremely low temperature, so broadening mechanisms are all ruled out. And you also have removed all the interactions. You know, I said some time ago, how do I mute these interactions? Essentially, what I have done here is I have muted all the hydrogen bonded interactions. And therefore, you will see that all I'm seeing is a spectrum of monomeric water molecule. But that's not what I want. I want to study the spectrum of a water molecule interacting with another water molecule through a hydrogen bond and I want to see whether I can catch this hydrogen bonding interaction. So what do I do? After having recorded this, after having deposited this matrix where I have this water molecule isolated from each other, first record the spectrum. So I now have the spectrum of this monomeric water. Then what I do is I play a little game. What I do is I heat this matrix from 10 Kelvin. I go to about 30 Kelvin, 30 to 35 Kelvin. And I leave this at this temperature for about 30 minutes. Now, because I have increased the temperature of this matrix from 10 Kelvin to 30 Kelvin, I've imparted some energy. And at this temperature, there will be small diffusion of these water, of these molecules back and forth. And let's see what will happen. So if I allow this temperature increase, and this is what we call as annealing, if I start doing that, then you'll see that the molecules start moving around like so. And it is quite likely as a result of this diffusion, two water molecules now would have come close to each other. Of course, you can say, oh, why can't I get three? Why can't I get four water molecules coming close together? The trick is to keep the concentration of water so low that to begin with, you have monomeric water. And when you diffuse, the concentration is still so low that it is highly likely that you are going to be able to see a dimer and highly unlikely that you will see a trimer. If I want to see a trimer, I can increase the water concentration from 1 is to 1,000 to maybe 10 is to 1,000 and so on. And then I improve the chances of seeing a trimer and so on. But for the first few experiments, I want to see only the dimer. Therefore, I keep the concentration 
so low relative to the inert gas that to begin with i see monomeric water and when i anneal the matrix all i'm going to be able to see is probably a few water molecules finding their rightful partners like what i have shown over here and now therefore i have a water dimer so i have now turned on one hydrogen bonding interaction if i now go and record the spectrum of this species you will now see new peaks coming up because of the fact that the hydrogen bonding interaction has been established that is basically what i have done so initially there were two water molecules isolated from each other and now i have two water molecules that have oriented themselves in such a way as a result of the diffusion process that i now have a hydrogen bonding interaction and the boy you know if you record a spectrum you will be in a position to see your hydrogen bonding peaks but if i want to study hydrogen and ammonia for example what would i do well i won't take just water and uh, argon i will take one part of water one part of ammonia and thousand parts of uh, argon and then deposit a matrix so i will get maybe some water molecules here some ammonia molecules but all completely uh, isolated from each other if i if i now record the spectrum i will get the spectrum of monomeric water and monomeric ammonia but if i now anneal it then it is quite likely that i might see the ammonia water interaction just like what i showed over here and it depending on the situation you could see both the isomers one where ammonia is the proton donor and one where the water is the proton donor and therefore this is a technique that will help you see which of the uh, you know different isomeric species if there is a possibility to see them okay so you could possibly see both of them and of course once you have the experiments done you have these uh, uh, infrared features that you will see but then you need to assign them and to do these assignments you have to take resort to quantum mechanical calculations so we do we were doing our own calculations we were doing geometry optimizations calculating vibrational frequencies interaction energies isotropic shifts and so on but uh, this is just to tell you that experiments alone will not be enough you have to take support of computational procedures to be able to assign your experimental data now let me give you some a picture i'm not i'm not going to give you technical details but i'm going to tell you a story as to how the whole process unfolds now let us look at the example of acetylene and water i told you about water and water i talked to you about water and ammonia now let us look at acetylene and water now when you look at acetylene and water here is one possibility where acetylene can be the proton donor the hydrogen and acid in acetylene is reasonably acidic in other words it can latch on to the oxygen in the water to form a hydrogen bond so you can have an acetylene water hydrogen bond where acetylene is a proton donor but you can also have the alternate structure where the water is a proton donor and it donates a proton to the pi cloud of acetylene mind you in any hydrogen bonding interaction you want a proton donor and you want an electron rich center at the other molecule which can be the proton acceptor in the first case where acetylene was a proton donor the electron rich center was oxygen you have two lone pairs on it therefore there is an electron rich center in the case of acetylene as a proton acceptor what happens is the water donates the proton the acetylene uses its pi cloud as the electron rich center to form the hydrogen bonding interaction and serves as the proton acceptor so here you have two structures where one water is the proton donor to acetylene and the first one where acetylene is a proton donor to water and both these structures are possible and the question is which is the one with, that i would see and what does theory tell me when i do a computation what does the computation tell me which of these structures is going to be more stable or is going to be you know more possible than the other now the with the most stable structure is what we call as a global minimum and therefore the question is is acetylene proton donor the global minimum or the water proton donor is that going to be the global minimum actually if you work at it, it you can do the calculations and you can check as to see as to what happens the so people have done these experiments earlier this was a work done in 1983 for the acetylene water structures and they showed that the acetylene donating a proton to water is the more favorable structure in other words the acetylene as a proton donor is the one that is more favored it was observed experimentally and computationally also it was predicted to be the more stable structure not the one in which water donates a proton to the acetylene pi cloud so this was a very clear cut case of two isomers possible but one of them dominating over the other 
and the dominant structure over here is the one in which acetylene was the proton donor and water was the proton acceptor. Experimentally, that structure was observed and computationally, that structure was the one predicted. Therefore, there was a good match between experiment and computations. So in this case, acetylene as a proton donor beats water as a proton donor and for a reason and we will see what that is. So if you draw the potential energy diagram, you can see the acetylene proton donor being the global minimum and the water, water as a proton donor being the local minimum. And this is the one that was experimentally observed by Nylander and co-workers, Nylander and Engel. Now, let's see some intriguing features in this. The hydrogen attached to carbon is what we are saying is participating in a hydrogen bond. Remember the classical definition of the hydrogen bond. We said the hydrogen must be attached to an electronegative atom and then should be bonding to another electronegative atom. Now, here is a situation where hydrogen is bonded to carbon in this case. Four is the hydrogen atom and three is the carbon atom of acetylene. So, the hydrogen atom attached to carbon is the one that is involved in this hydrogen bonding. So, it sort of doesn't really fit into the old definition of the hydrogen bond. And, and mind you, carbon is not that greatly electronegative to be called as a hydrogen attached to an electronegative atom. And this sort of an interaction is popularly called as the CHO interaction. And already you can see that the old definition of the hydrogen bond needs to be corrected. It is not necessary that the hydrogen be attached only to electronegative atoms. It could be attached to carbon and it could still be involved in a hydrogen bonding interaction. Here the proton donor is fine, but the proton donor is, uh, is not an electronegative atom in this case. Because it's only a pi bond, the proton donor atom, the proton acceptor is not an electronegative atom. In the case of ammonia, Ammonia was the electron, the proton acceptor, but then the nitrogen was an electronegative atom, and therefore the old definition was fine. In this case, the proton acceptor is not an electronegative atom; it's a pi cloud, and therefore you see that this case study of acetylene water clearly is asking for the hydrogen bond definition to be reworded or corrected. IUPAC now has a more encompassing definition almost 90 years after the discovery of the hydrogen bond. As a result of all these studies, we realized that the old definition had to be corrected or had to en encompass more cases, had to encompass more situations that could not be fitted into the old definition. Little history in this case of the CHO type hydrogen bond. It was first proposed in 1962 by June Souter based on a crystallographic work. However, since it defied the then accepted definition of the hydrogen bond, the first time it was proposed, her idea was vehemently criticized and even ridiculed. <laughs> they said hydrogen is not attached to an electronegative atom. Therefore, please don't talk to us about hydrogen attached to carbon as being indulging in uh, hydrogen bonding interaction. So it was basically vehemently criticized and even ridiculed. But 20 years after she made a proposal, her idea began to be accepted because experimental evidence emerged from other research groups proving the existence of such an interaction. And today, of course, we very clearly accept the uh, role of CHO interactions, particularly in biology. It has a huge role to play in many of the studies on protein and enzyme interactions. CHO interactions also play, as I said, plays a very important role in biology because there are so many CH groups that are present in biology and many of them do take part in these hydrogen bonding interactions. Now, let's move a little to see the complications that can arise. We, we talked about acetylene. We talked about acetylene and we said acetylene and water gives two isomeric structures, but acetylene as a proton donor is the one that is favored. Let's do phenylacetylene. What I'm doing in phenylacetylene is I'm removing <coughs> one hydrogen, which is four, and putting a phenyl group over there. So instead of hydrogen over here, I have a benzene group over here, and there was this is phenylacetylene. And now I would like to study the structures of phenylacetylene, the hydrogen bonding interaction of phenylacetylene with water. Is it similar to acetylene water or does it provide some surprises? Now, again, the same thing. When you look at phenylacetylene water, it can have two possible structures where the proton donor could be the acetylenic part, CHO, or the water could be the donator to the pi cloud of acetylene. Both are possible. Now, these two structures are very similar to the structures I showed you in the case of acetylene. But remember, in the case of acetylene, we said that this structure was the one that was favored and this structure was not favored. But if you go back and do the experiments, of, this is just to remind you, in the case of acetylene, this structure was favored. But if you go back and do the computations on the phenylacetylene water, it turned out that this structure is the one that is more favored. 
So clearly there's a very different picture that emerges simply because you put a phenyl group at one end of the acetylene molecule. Now, Patwari's group and Arunan's group at IIT Bombay and IIT respectively have actually experimentally observed this interaction, OH pi interaction, the structure that was predicted by computations. And they showed that this was the global minimum in this case. We did our matrix isolation experiments and we showed that the first structure was also observed, was observed in our experiments. But the point to be taken note of here is the following. While in acetylene, the CHO interaction with the water, with the proton donor is the acetylene was the favored structure. Why is it in phenylacetylene water? The phenylacetylene wants to act as a proton acceptor and not as a proton donor. Why is this change in mind? In other words, if you look at the energy profile diagram now, you can see that the water donating a proton to the pi cloud is the most stable structure, most favored structure. Whereas the proton donor, where the acetylene is a proton donor to water, phenylacetylene is a proton donor to water, is the much less favored structure relative to this, this structure in the, in the case of phenylacetylene. In other words, there's a clear shift in the, the architecture of the whole complexes. So while in acetylene, this structure is the most favored, the balance is tilted in this case. Now, if you go to phenylacetylene, the balance gets tipped due to some factors, the balance is tipped in this direction. In other words, this structure becomes more favored rather than this structure. And the question is, what is that factor that really tilts the structure, tilts the balance towards the OH pi structure in the case of phenylacetylene and not the CHO, which was what was observed in the case of acetylene? Well, this just it turned out that this extra factor was this extra hydrogen bonding interaction that you had between the carbon, hydrogen, or benzene group <coughs> and the oxygen. So you had an extra interaction. So you had the primary interaction between the hydrogen of water and the pi cloud. And this extra interaction that was between the CHO was probably what was causing this interaction to occur. You didn't have the possibility of that interaction in acetylene. In the case of acetylene, the OH pi interaction had to depend only on this OH pi interaction. Whereas in this case, the OH pi interaction was supported by the CHO interaction. And it is the additional interaction that came in, that which was which was the factor that tilted the balance towards the structure in the case of phenylacetylene. So in other words, this very weak interaction, which is almost like a fly, sits on this structure. So the CHO, extra CHO contact that we talked about serves as the, the, as the additional factor that tilts the balance towards the uh, H pi structure in the case of phenylacetylene and water, uh, uh, phenylacetylene and water. So what's the take home message? The take home message, of course, you would have seen that the comments have been made about the CHO interactions. The CHO contacts are present in large number of proteins and so on. And most of these interactions are weak and their functions are normally supportive at best. What we want to believe is that it is not just supportive. These weak, clear CHO interactions can be more than supportive. In fact, they can be the one assertive in deciding what is the most stable structure. Without that CHO interaction in the case of acetylene, the OH pi structure was not to be seen at all. Whereas in the case of phenylacetylene, the introduction of the CHO structure actually made the structure a lot more stable and in fact made it the global minimum. In other words, the lesson is don't underestimate the power of the CHO interaction. This result is very crucial in many docking studies that you could see in, this, in, in biology. I'll just give you one more example. Remove the, again, this is acetylene, but remove the hydrogen and put the CH2OH group. This is propargyl alcohol, okay? And which is of great importance. Bala was, would, be, would be thrilled to see propargyl alcohol because it's a molecule of great importance in astrochemical studies and so on. But why did we do this? What we did was we want to replace the benzene group over here with this CH2OH. Now CH2OH can provide an extremely strong secondary interaction through this OHO interaction. So now what happens? Now when you look at this structure over here, you'll find that the propargyl alcohol, this OH structure becomes extremely stable, a lot more stable than the other structure. In the case of phenylacetylene water, this OHO structure was way bit stronger than the phenylacetylene water CHO. In the case of acetylene, the CHO interaction was the only one to be seen. The other one could not even be seen. And therefore, you could see how secondary interactions can play a very important role in deciding about the structures of these compounds.
I will quickly wind up because I think I've got to almost the end of my allotted time, you know, at 450. Confirmations of amino acids, for example, if you look at this, there are so many different possible structures that you can see. And we, we were studying these uh, uh, amino acid confirmations and we called one of them as type 1 structure, which, is, looks, which looks like this. And this is a type 2 structure. Let's not go into the others. If you look at the type 1 structure, which is what most amino acids uh, adopt, why do they do so? Because in a type 1 structure, you have an OH and then you have a nitrogen. And then you can have a hydrogen bonding interaction between two different fragments of the same molecule. And that is what I told you earlier. So here is a hydrogen bonding interaction between two different fragments of the same molecule. And that leads to a stabilization of certain conformations. And therefore, you see that in amino acids, most of the amino acids adopt this sort of a structure as the most stable structure. <laughs> <laughs> because of the fact that this structure turns out to have this hydrogen bonding interactions, which contributes enormously to the stability of the structure. But there are very many different types, the OHO, OHN, OHS type hydrogen bonding, NHO type hydrogen bonding, CHO, OH5, CH5, many of which we saw. And therefore you can see that hydrogen bonding interactions occurs in all sorts of hues and colors. And these are all weak interactions. Is there life beyond hydrogen bonds? Yes, today we talk about halogen bonds, we talk about carbon bonds, but that is for some other day. What are the take-home lessons? Hydrogen bonds are all pervading. It's important in chemistry, biology, physics, geosciences, and what have you. Its interaction is between a hydrogen attached to an electronegative atom and interacting with another electronegative atom. This is a classical definition. Is it right? No. It's hydrogen bond. Today we have a modified definition because we now know that hydrogen attached to carbon, which is not even in a strongly electronegative atom, or uh, hydrogen attaching themselves to a pi cloud to form the hydrogen bonds. All of that has to be included. Today, we have an all-encompassing hydrogen bonding interaction, which, of course, if you Google it up, you'll see the IUPAC definition, which I didn't want to put up here because I just want to send home the, the message as that to the, to the effect that you need a modification of the definition itself. Now, hydrogen bonds are all come in all hues and colors, as I just showed you. You have primary and secondary interactions must be taken together, which is basically the burden of my song in this talk. And one cannot affect, one cannot afford to ignore the contribution of the secondary interactions because they could, in fact, finally decide what is the structure and the stability of the complex. There are further structural issues, which of course called antagonism, which we came up with, but which we won't discuss over here. The team that I worked with and which, uh, which I'm very thankful to are all these students, Pankaj, Gargi, Gini, Akshay, Jyoti, uh, Kanupriya and Piyush. There are many other students, my master's students that I have listed below, postdocs at like Vishnu Prasad and Anamika. All of these people have made the, the work in the group so enjoyable and so uh, fruitful. I also would like to thank all the research colleagues in various organizations with whom I have crossed paths with. Uh, particularly, I like to thank Sanjay, Vijay, Balanarayan, and Sukumar and Aitsar Mohali for all the help they gave me in terms of experimental aspects or discussions in theory and so on. And all the faculty members in chemistry and other departments that I serve, from whom I've received unstinted support. One has to keep in mind that without a supportive peer group, nothing much is achieved. And I surely thank Aysel Mohali for all the support and facilities. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. I was I always fascinated. Time. Time. Uh, no, no, thank you. Uh, I am always fascinated about the hydrogen bonds and, of course, the technique, matrix isolation, isolated infrared spectroscopy. The yeah. way it, it, it is very useful to look into the molecular interactions and so on. So thanks, Art, again. Uh, with this, I will hand over to Professor Lokesh for the question and answer session. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Vala. And uh, thank you, Professor Vishwanathan, for a very exciting talk covering great details about hydrogen bond interactions in the system as well. Now, I'm sure that our audiences who have gone through WebEx and also in YouTube, they will be looking forward to interact with you. Surely, surely. So, so the, now the session is open for the interaction session. So I invite our participants <coughs> from both WebEx and YouTube channel to have their questions. So you can raise your hands. So we have uh, one, Bala, uh, uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Professor Roshanathan, uh, when we talk about this hydrogen bonding, 
right so uh, there are molecules that are uh, suppose say for example the molecule uh, ethylene glycol which has mm-hmm. uh, two oh chains right yeah and then it is interacting with the water molecule and so on where the uh, again we have a hydrogen on the water molecule yeah so can you please comment on this interaction yeah see when you have multiple uh, sites for interaction and both oh groups are uh, you know very powerful hydrogen bonding uh, moieties in the sense they can act as proton acceptors and proton donors so you could have one is to one complexes one is to two complexes and you know one is to many also so depending on the relative amounts of water and ethylene glycol that you have you know you can see a whole variety of complexes that can, that can be formed and therefore that that does provide a very very rich scenario as far as the hydrogen bonded complexes that you would get in such multifunctional groups that you that you have talked about and uh, and of course you can also have uh, you know by uh, uh, complexes in which one water molecule could be attached to both these ch2oh groups in the ethylene glycol you know as, as something acting like a bridge and so on so you have a very wide variety of uh, complexes you know a very rich uh, potential energy surface that you will see in this case which of course you know the richer the potential energy surface the greater is the challenge for the experimentalist because now the experimentalist has to figure out you know what is it that he is really seeing in the experiments and therefore it's, uh, that, that is something that we saw in the case of for example the phenylacetylene formic acid experiment that we did it had so many different structures possible from theory and many of them were nearly i i degenerate that the question was you know what am i really seeing in the experiment so we had to adopt some very strict uh, controls and so on to be able to figure out what was happening i'm sure ethylene glycol water would do something similar Oh. Uh, I'll ask one more question, okay? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, uh, what are the limitations of uh, matrix isolation in front spectroscopy? Well, Do the we have... uh, the limitation one very uh, clear limitation is that the molecule that you want to study must have a reasonable vapor pressure because I would take it, you know, pass it through the tube and then deposit it on the uh, So if you ask me to take the matrix isolation spectrum of ion, I wouldn't be able to do it because ion won't have a vapor pressure. But we can get around that problem too, in the sense that I can take the uh, very uh, low vapor pressure material inside the vacuum system itself and heat it there, and then have it deposited. So the amino acid experiment that Pankaj did was one such experiment. So the limitation there, therefore, is you must be able to get vapor pressures at room temperature or at easily realizable temperatures. if my temperature you know if i have to go to 600 700 degrees to get reasonable uh, vapor pressures then the experiment is doable but that much more complicated so that is one issue and of course the other thing is you know if you want to study uh, higher complexes one is to two one is to three one is to four they have to relatively increase the the amounts of the substance the relative concentrations of the inert gas to the water to the uh, to the to the partner molecules and that will then give give rise to so many other complexes with the experiment that then becomes a lot more structured but uh, rather than talking about the limitation there is an advantage in doing matrix isolation in fact which came about very nicely in the case of the phenylacetylene water while arunan and patwari saw the global minimum they did not see the global minimum which was the acetylene acting as a proton donor to water but that could be seen in the matrix the reason being the matrix caught the local minimum whereas in a gas phase experiment the local minimum would tumble down to the global minimum eventually to a conformer interconversion isomer interconversion whereas in the cage effect of the matrix it preserves the local minimum and therefore one could see that and therefore the work of arunan and patwari and ours together actually covered the entire potential surface so that's basically the issue <coughs> thank you professor viswanathan we have uh, another hand raised from uh, professor deswandi yeah deswandi thank you deswandi. okay huh. thank you professor viswanathan that was really a very good talk um, i have a couple of question though i am not a physicist but we do use isotopes for studying hydrological processes i am a hydrologist yes. and yes. we use little bit of uh, isotopes now one question is that is there a concept of uh, lifetime of these hydrogen bonds uh, and is there some known differences in the lifetime of the hydrogen bond between two lighter isotopologues and one lighter and one heavier yeah in the case of my experiment you know where we trapped it in the matrix the lifetime is infinite because there is it has nowhere to go 
But if you're looking at it in the real life situation, like in the case of water, for example, the hydrogen bonds are dynamic. They will keep forming, yeah. breaking, forming, breaking. And what you really would be seeing in an experiment is the average of this, average of the whole process, unless you're using the ultra fast process, which, which delve into the realm of PICO and femtosecond spectroscopy. So on extremely fast time scales, the hydrogen bonds are forming and breaking. And that's basically what it is. Now the question of the lighter and heavier isotopes, you will see that the moment I go into a heavier isotope, then the, 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 the zero point energy actually drops. And therefore the hydrogen bonding interaction becomes that much stronger than for the lighter isotope. And moment it becomes a little bit stronger, then the kinetics of the breakage and the formation is also going to be affected. And uh, that is something that one could see when you shift to different isotopes. So if you change the isotope, yes, you will affect the dynamics of the process because the barrier for the reactions are increased for the heavier isotope relative to the lighter isotope. And therefore, the kinetics of any process for that, for that matter, so this is something that one uses quite routinely in chemistry to understand the kinetics of this process by doing isotopic uh, uh, substitution studies. So yes, the dynamics will be different for the heavier and the lighter isotopes. So are there some uh, research groups who, who are uh, experimentally monitoring these time scales? Oh, yes, yes, yes. There are plenty of research groups all over who have to delve into ultra-fast spectroscopic studies who really are very keen to study the uh, kinetics of this bond making and bond breaking processes in these hydrogen bonding interactions. It's a very, it's a, it's a subject of great interest and people have been looking at it. Okay. I have one more question that you said that uh, we had a very primitive kind of definition now of the hydrogen bond. So with the type of complications which you have now told us, what do you think should be a uh, more practical definition? Yeah, the more practical it's definition. Which you yeah. said it's not the interaction yeah, the between hydrogen and electronegativity. Yes, the more practical definition is what the IUPAC uh, with, in the, with Arunan as the lead member, you know, actually put out. <laughs> <laughs> That basically, you know, removes all these words, electronegative and things like that. It only says that a fragment of a molecule, which can interact with another molecule, which has got an electron in its center and so on, without talking about the necessity to have electronegative centers at both ends. So once you remove that, then it basically becomes possible for any uh, hydrogen attached to any atom seeking an electron rich center and forming a hydrogen bond. So. In earlier cases, you know, in the Pauling's definition and Latimer and Rodewood definition, all these, they use these sentences, you know, they use these uh, criteria of electronegative atoms because that is where they saw the hydrogen bonds and therefore that was used. But today we know that all you need is a hydrogen attached to, you know, an is a, to any element, carbon, hydrogen, you know, nitrogen, oxygen, doesn't matter. And all it is doing is seeking an electron rich center. As long as you have these two conditions met, you will have a hydrogen bond. So that's the more... Uh, all encompassing the, uh, the definition, but uh, which actually takes away all the little details that were un unnecessarily present in the earlier definition. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pandeji. So I invite colleagues for the interactions. We have time. <coughs> so meanwhile, uh, Professor Vishnath and I, I would like to ask uh, some questions. Sure. Yeah. So. Uh, as you know that uh, water is an important greenhouse gas in the earth atmosphere, right? And uh, there are many other gases like methane and other uh, CO2, they are also greenhouse gases. Now, if you if you look at the per molecular basis, their potential as a greenhouse mm -hmm. gas, they are very different. Yeah. So, so in terms of, you know, this potential, greenhouse warming potential, is that the bond in each molecule plays important role or kind of bind which is presence which is present which is important see when you when you look at the greenhouse potential with the greenhouse effect basically what you're looking at is that uh, infrared absorption right right so so what you really want is for the if the molecule has a very strong uh, absorption in the infrared region right. and uh, and if they so essentially the infrared radiation reflected off the surface of the earth and the gases pick it up and then they re-radiate it. That's where your greenhouse effect comes in. So the greenhouse potential will be related to the absorption cross-sections, the infrared absorption cross-sections of these molecules. Right. That's basically what it will be. Now in the atmosphere, for example, if you look at it, you know, carbon dioxide, for example, is what, a few hundred ppm, 400 ppm or thereabout. Yeah. And therefore, you are likely to see only, uh, you know, monomeric carbon dioxide molecules. 
and therefore the uh, hydrogen bonding interactions over there i don't know whether they play a big role i think it is the inherent absorption of the infrared radiation by water or carbon dioxide water of course is also you know is a very strong greenhouse gas which actually keeps the temperature of the earth to a very comfortable 30 40 or whatever it is if i can call 40 comfortable but that's where it is without the water we would have been much lower so water is a good greenhouse gas what carbon dioxide is and it is the on, on these molecules might you have strong infrared absorptions and it is the infrared absorption uh, uh, strength that contributes to their uh, greenhouse potential and so does methane for example so. uh, another question is uh, related to i mean uh, it is about uh, uh, interaction between you know there are many uh, hydrocarbons present in the atmosphere, like acid rains also there in significant yeah. amount, yeah, yeah. propane and other things is there. And water is also there. Water is also there. Yeah. So uh, when you talk about uh, removal of uh, the, these hydrocarbons from the atmosphere, we only talk about reactions with hydroxyl radicals. That's correct. OH dot. Right. right. But uh, why not uh, interaction with water is uh, plays an important role in removal? Why not? I didn't get the Why not one. interaction with water itself? Okay. Water and the acid in it. Yeah. See, the, the, the interaction of the hydrocarbons with water is certainly going on the rate constant for any reaction there. You know, I don't think that you even have a, a, a viable reaction of water with just the hydrocarbon. The hydroxyl radical being a very reactive species, therefore serves as the atmospheric detergent for us. So all the hydrocarbons can do with water is maybe form extremely weak CHO type interaction, which will break in no time, the question which was asked earlier. And therefore, that is not going to contribute to any big uh, uh, the reaction that of any consequence. But then with water and a photochemical reaction going on, giving you the OH dot. And OH dot is a very active species which can pick up hydrogen out of the hydrocarbon, giving you a reactive species. And then that goes on to conduct reactions and breaking it down. And therefore, I think the uh, hydroxyl radical, because of its sheer reactivity, is the one that can contribute. Water uh, is going to be nowhere near in competition to the OH radical as far as cleaning up the atmosphere is concerned. Yes. Okay. And thank you. And uh, my last question is that uh, suppose the the water is present in a gaseous form in, or in droplet form. Okay. So mm -hmm. does it have a different effect uh, as far as greenhouse gas effect is concerned? I mean, different. If, if you have it in a droplet form, then you have multiple hydrogen bondings within that. You know, the one that I showed you, because you have right. lots of water molecules, you'll have multiple hydrogen bonding. Therefore, it could, uh, in effect, you know, be good for solvation, maybe, you know, solvating some gases, solvating some material. Whereas in the gaseous form, if uh, depending on the concentration, it would be more in the monomeric form or maybe dimeric form, if at best, depending on the concentration. And therefore, the chemistry would be quite different that way. Because in one case, it would act more like a solvent. In the other case, it's going to act like a molecular reagent at best. Okay. So, uh, so it's still, uh, it's the uh, it's last call for questions. If colleagues have, they, they have any questions. Otherwise, we have kind of come to the end of the question answer session. So, uh, can I ask yes. one more question? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, uh, Professor Vishwadhan, just one question about the matrix resolution in broad spectroscopy part. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what do you uh, think will be the best matrix in terms of this neon, argon, and krypton? Uh, it depends on a few considerations. We were, we were, we always liked uh, nitrogen a lot. We used to do most of our experiments in nitrogen because for most of the molecules that we studied, the nitrogen matrix gave us extremely sharp features. Okay, now the question would, that you could ask is why does nitrogen give sharp features and not argon? But that's a big story in itself because we, we have to then start talking about site effects and so on. So argon is argon and nitrogen are normally used in a big way. The reason being that uh, both are extremely inexpensive. They can be got in pure form. When I say pure form, I'm talking about uh, five nines or thereabout. And therefore, you could you don't want to have a matrix that has got impurities in it. Because mind you, I'm doping the water or whatever I'm looking at in ratios of 1 is to 1,000. And if the impurities are also in that regime, then I'm going to have an interference from the impurity. So you need to have very pure uh, argon, very pure nitrogen. So you need matrix gases which are very pure and which can be easily caught. So most of our experiments have been done with uh, argon and nitrogen. We did do some experiments at some point with krypton and xenon. They are very expensive and therefore that is not something that you would want to do. 
helium is out of the question for now because the helium uh, you know at 10 kelvin you can't solidify helium and therefore helium is a very popular choice of supersonic gas experiments but not a popular choice for the uh, matrix saturation experiments and that's basically so if you want to do matrix saturation at 10 kelvin or maybe even go to 4 kelvin there are cryostats that can take you to 4 kelvin the popular choices have been many people have used argon most of the time argon and nitrogen and uh, the others maybe a little less because of the uh, expense factor but keep in mind that when you, by the time you go to uh, krypton and xenon the inert gases themselves are not so inert because they have a high polarizability and they will start interacting with your molecule and therefore the inner matrix themselves is not going to be so inert by the time you go to xenon the best inert gas would have been helium because it would be completely silent it would not interact at all but the point is you can't solidify helium it was the next best is neon but neon is expensive so, but the next best is argon and it works <laughs> yeah so uh, so we have come to an end of this uh, question answer session so thank you once again sir for accepting accepting thank you all thank you all for uh, uh, inviting very, me and thank you all for listening to me and for the nice discussions that we yeah. have so now i invite my colleague uh, dr durga prasad for the vote of thanks Thank you, Professor Lokesh. So, on behalf of the director of PRL, our Amrit Vyakyan committee, and entire PRL, I thank Professor K. S. Vishwanathan for accepting our invitation and delivering the 71st Vyakyan of our Vyakyan series. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation and delivering an interesting Vyakyan on hydrogen bonded interactions and their influence on various chemical, physical, and biochemical processes. And also a lot of thanks for patiently answering all the questions. I thank our director, Professor Anil Bhardwaj, for his constant encouragement and support for taking this uh, uh, series of Akyans ahead. I thank our dean, Professor Pallam Raju, Professor Nandita, chair, and Professor Lokesh, co-chair, and all other members of Amrit Akyan committee, and others behind for their constant efforts for uh, making this <coughs> possible. Most importantly, many thanks goes to our participants and viewers on Webex, as well as YouTube, who have joined us today for this Vakyan. With this, we come to the end of uh, this uh, episode of our Amrit Vakyan. It's now time to take leave from PRL. We will be back next week on Wednesday with another interesting Vakyan. Till then, stay tuned and keep following us. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bala. See you later sometime. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You said I should leave, right? I should not. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to.